I'm Sarah Bondik. I'm a group leader at the University of Cambridge and I have a, an interdisciplinary lab that's split between the Department of Physics and the Cancer Research UK Cambridge Institute. So we're um, interested in developing non-invasive approaches for characterising tumours and their metabolism. And in particular, we're interested in how tumours use oxygen and what impact that has on survival for patients. And we work very closely with clinical collaborators to try and make sure the sort of technologies that we're developing that can non-invasively assess these parameters actually have the opportunity to translate and have an impact in the management of the patients. Imaging has a really important role to play in diagnosis and treatment of cancer. In particular, it gives us an opportunity to not only localize the, the position of the tumor in the body or perhaps the metastases from that tumor in the body, but it also gives us a chance to map spatially how the, um, the heterogeneity of the tumor is so we can think about different areas having different metabolic properties, different structural properties, and different functional properties. And imaging gives us a non-invasive window into all of that. But of course, imaging is just one part of how we look at patients, and it's also a relatively expensive part of how we look at patients. So in addition to that, we have properties like uh, blood biomarkers, where we might look at cells that have been secreted out from the tumor or circulating DNA. And while they tell us something about how the tumor, say, is responding to therapy, they again don't give us that um, spatial information that we can get with imaging. And on the flip side, we can get some information from biopsies. So we can do some molecular genetic proteomic, for example, characterization of the tumor if we can access tissue from the tumor. But that's a relatively coarse sampling. So while the kind of uh, gold standard of biopsies and the kind of emerging approach to blood biomarkers are very promising, I think imaging is an important intersection between those two. But our biggest challenge is really with cost. Cost not just of the devices for imaging, but also of the people to operate those devices. So often imaging devices are not something that can be operated by a non-specialist user. And that means that we need to have them centered in like, large hospitals or healthcare centers instead of being distributed out to more local physicians. Despite the fact that many tumors are what we call highly glycolytic, so they rely on anaerobic re respiration. Um, they also have a, a clear need for oxygen and nutrients to be delivered via the blood supply. But that blood supply is also usually rather chaotic and tortuous. It can be rather leaky. It develops in a very ad hoc manner as the tumor grows and secretes factors to stimulate the growth of new blood vessels into its mass. And so as a result of that, we have areas within the tumor which are hypoxic, so deprived of oxygen. And we also have areas within the tumor that are oxidatively stressed. So they receive almost too much oxygen and they're not able to cope with it. And so what is interesting about these two stresses is that both of them have been linked to the outcome of the disease. It's a very interesting problem for us as imagers. Oxygen delivery is very hard to measure and especially the consumption and turnover of the oxygen is incredibly difficult to extract. It's a very dynamic process. It's typically, we're looking at things at very low concentration in the tumor mass. So it's a very challenging imaging problem, um, which hopefully if we understood better from the biological perspective could actually impact patient outcome. I was actually inspired to go into the area of looking at uh, kind of oxygen and nutrients in cancer when I was doing uh, my first postdoc. And I was working on vitamin C, you know, a common antioxidant that we're all familiar with and often take as supplements. And it, I realized very quickly when I started to read into the literature that actually we knew very little about how this very basic vitamin was used in the body, how it was turned over in cells. And that was really just because we had no way to dynamically measure it. We couldn't image the distribution of the vitamin C. We couldn't see which cells were metabolizing it and which cells weren't. And I thought it was very interesting that after uh, you know, many, many years of research into the area of antioxidants and looking at um, oxidative stresses, we still were at a relatively um, primitive stage in our understanding. And so that inspired me to try to develop new technologies which would help us to get a better sense or a better readout of these dynamic processes of um, redox, so antioxidants and free radicals, but also of the use of oxygen. And I've sort of been along that path ever since, looking at blood oxygenation, look at oxidative stresses and antioxidants, and trying to develop not just technologies, but also contrast agents that allow us to probe those processes. I think there's a lot of promise for optical techniques, especially in uh, cancers of the gastrointestinal tract. We can see a lot of techniques emerging which allow us to characterize very early microstructural changes in the tumor and very early metabolic changes in the tumor. And that 
is not just something that happens late in the disease development. Many of these processes that we're able to now probe happen uh, very early in the disease development, even before cancer has arisen. So, for example, in a, a dysplastic or an inflammatory lesion uh, in the gastrointestinal tract. For our particular area of research, trying to work at the clinical interface, our, our biggest challenge is actually thinking about uh, methodology, for, methodology for translation. Not just how we take a technology uh, through to clinic, and the potential commercialization pathway that that has to follow, but also how we make the device um, acceptable to the clinician, how we make it fit into their clinical pipeline, and how it actually will aid them to make their diagnosis or decision. And that's something that I think uh, is often overlooked from us as uh, engineers and physicists. We tend to like to focus on the development of our technology, but you, you see the ones that really successfully bridge that gap are the, the technologies that are able um, not just to give us additional information, about the disease that we're trying to characterize, but also that uh, fit very well into the, the clinical pathway that is already set up for the patients.